after this session. So welcome everyone. Let's start this seminar. Uh, welcome to all of you. It's, it's nice to be up and running with our seminar series again after a, some months of, 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 uh, of non-existence. Uh, we will continue now this, this process until, uh, let, let's say, mid-June. For those of you that can take the day and block it for between 13 and 14 on Wednesdays. Uh, to, today we have with us um, uh, Maurice uh, Riedel. Um, Maurice Riedel is a professor at the uh, Faculty of Industrial Engineering, Mechanical Engineering and, and Computer Science. And he has been, uh, he, he has been offering to have this, uh, his, uh, this lecture on parallel and scalable machine and deep learning drive, driven by high performance computing. He will uh, introduce himself uh, after I, 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 I give him the floor. Uh, I would just like to say that Morris has been uh, has been in, in collaboration with all faculty for <clears throat> quite many years now. Uh, so so he is not new for many of us, but I, I think though most of us have maybe not been so much in relationships with him. Uh, uh, so I thought it was a very good idea to try to get him here because he is the the one of two of, of our newest professors. Uh, I was always had in my mind to ask uh, ask Morris to give this speak speech uh, and as an introductory lecture for his uh, coming coming professorship. Uh, but uh, due to these things, we know what's happening. Uh, there was not possible to do that uh, if in physical uh, situation. So the, we ended up doing it this way, and I think the message will be the same. But and you see how he looks like. Uh, that's good. Uh, so if you meet him in the corridor, I don't, you are in Iceland, Morris, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So if you meet him it's in here, the corridor, finally. You, you know who this guy is. He's not just sneaking around. <laughs> My name is Gunnar Stefansson, and I'm the chairman of the board of, of the Engineering Research Institute at the University of Iceland. And I will be uh, the, your host here today. Morris will give the speech. Uh, I will record this, as you maybe know, and, and uh, if you have any comments or questions, please uh, state them on the chat during the, uh, during the seminar or ask them in the end of, uh, of, of, of Morris' speech uh, so he can then answer them directly to you. We have uh, 27 people in the audience now, uh, so I'm looking forward to this, and I know there's a lot of in interesting stuff in this lecture. I've, I've heard Morris before, uh, so I would just like to welcome you, Morris. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me? That's always your first question. <laughs> we can hear you, and you're not muted. Excellent. <laughs> very good, very good. So, yeah, thank you very much, um, actually, for two things. First of all, for giving me the opportunity to present an overview of my research so that many, hopefully many here in the University of Iceland can connect to this research in one way or another. And of course, uh, secondly, I'm, I'm very grateful to be finally here full professor since 2020. It was a bit rumble start within the COVID times, but it is really very nice to be here finally. I was basically since 2013 an associated professor here at the University of Iceland with a strong collaboration. You see this also on the slide here with the Jülich Supercomputing Center in Germany, which is hosting uh, the number th seven currently in HPC systems and number one in Europe. So I have been in this center since 17 years now and we still have a very lively collaboration I will talk about. But also this talk gives me the opportunity to act as the evangelist of HPC a little bit in this country of um, Iceland. Um, being also the Euro HPC governing board member of Iceland, I try as much as I can to bring this technology uh, actually closer to industry, closer to scientific groups and my talk in a way should also reflect that. Uh, I think Gunnar already talked uh, about that we have some links already. So actually we go back to some track here and now and then in the talk uh, of actually students you maybe remember being in the corridors here, maybe in Technigada, maybe in VR2. Um, and we'll also basically connect the research that we have done over the years with what we will also do in the future. So an interesting journey of students is about to start and uh, yes, yeah, start with a little bit of interesting movie. I hope that is uh, something you can hear now. No. 
We see it, but we don't hear it. No, okay. Well, the point is here, essentially, then I would say, I just go over the outline, right? And would say um, that um, we would have, first of all, with the outline and understanding of key technologies to do. You see on the right on the video, um, this high performance computing is a complex topic um, and we want to understand it. And of course, on top of it, we have this interesting new topic of AI. So parallel and scalable machine learning and deep learning which we consider AI. AI is a very large part, but what we here will basically review today will be a bit focused on this. And of course, I don't want to just leave it in the room what all players do worldwide. We will reflect a little bit what Iceland is doing also in this context, of course, with strong international collaborations. And uh, to basically look a little bit why HPC is really needed. So why it is basically one of the key technologies maybe in the next decade and was in the last um, is really, it has impacts in lots of different areas from environment to healthcare economy. I just picked that three here as one example where we basically, or my research group is really working on. You can find lots of other examples uh, basically in a slide that will show very soon. I give some future work in summary of course and have all the references in. And during my talk, you will know, will see that so much work is of course not done by me alone. So you will see it's really the work of many PhD students. I have a very good postdoc um, called Gabriel Caballaro I work with who drive many of these activities with me. And he, interesting enough, he graduated from the University of Iceland as well. And is now at the Uli Supercomputing Center, uh, their deputy of my research group. Also, I would like to leave you on the table this Icelandic National Competence Center for HPC and AI. I will explain it a bit longer but there is a specific community gathering process we are in and you're all welcome to join me in this. Um, we have a couple of professors already aligned and I will make a statement how you can actually join us. So understanding key technologies, um, maybe it's good to understand first what is a HPC system? What is a supercomputer? And it has many ingredients, but if you boil it down, let's say to a couple of them, which are very essential, you would have essentially the most important that you see in the video while I'm talking, uh, the building infrastructure, right? So second floor, cooling, cables, gas actually, that is preventing fire and not water as you can imagine. So it's a huge infrastructure around it. Such a cluster like we see here in the middle would have, let's say many multi-core CPUs these days together coupled as a cluster. And it makes it a cluster and the HPC machine usually in the form that you see this nice interconnects between them. So basically we differentiate between HPC and HTC, high throughput computing, in the form of saying there's a very good interconnect between all of these different nodes, between all of these CPUs. You see here, for instance, a fully mesh network, but this really depends. People do Dragonfly today and many other, let's say network setups. And this is really a low latency, high bandwidth network, which means very much communication between the different, let's say, tasks that you execute on a high performance computer. More recently, um, I think many of you will know, is that GPUs entered the scene significantly, which was a playing device from NVIDIA uh, quite some time ago, has now become really one of the key essential additional, let's say, processors, which are basically put very close in each of the nodes to this multi-core CPUs. We talk about the host CPU in this context. Unfortunately, GPUs cannot live alone. They still always require CPU essentially to get uh, data in. And they are basically many core GPUs. So all of them are not really with high single thread performance. They are moderate speed, um, but the point is they have specific tensor cores, which makes it relevant for AI, but also hundreds to thousand processors for throughput. And a couple of other important things is parallel programming environments. So we have schedulers, so it's a concurrent access to the system. So many users use the system at the same time. So that needs to be taken care of. And we have parallel programming libraries here, for instance, very famous, the MPI, which sent messages between the different processors in distributed memory, but also shared memory with OpenMP, for instance, uh, doing then basically memory um, or shared memory programming. Also not to be forgotten is the data side. We will talk about this again and again today. So parallel file systems, storage, this is a very important part. These are all working in binary, as you can imagine, 
So then basically having binary parallel file formats is essential to not waste time in transforming essentially uh, large data sets which were coming out of these machines and the same way also going in the machines. And today we talk even about storage hierarchy. So you, in former times you would say a couple of disks, but now we talk about non-volatile memory. We talk about disks, tape archives, long-term preservation. So it's a huge bandwidth I cannot all basically put here on the slide. So this was a 101 in high performance computing and supercomputing. And of course, if you want to know more, there's always my course on YouTube uh, that you can have a look and have much more details on. So why is HPC um, a key technology? Why it's reflected in the commission of one of the key technologies in the next decade is essentially because it has almost all critical societal and economic applications um, today. So when you think about um, perhaps what we can connect to from the last week, uh, from the seminar from Patnal's death, where it was a bit about COVID-19 models. Of course, HPC has been significantly used in all the different models to understand the spreading of the disease. These are very computational intensive simulations we talk about. So understanding the spread of the virus here in a humidity condition or understanding the effectiveness of different masks with different people setups in cinemas close together, two meters distance, all of that, of course, is fueled by high performance computing simulations. Then you see a little bit of volcanic eruption. It's actually not the one we have right now. That's Ayafetia Yukut. That was a bit in the past, just to show you that, of course, uh, also for these kind of catastrophes, as you know, people in Germany would maybe call it here in Iceland, we see it rather sightseeing, I guess, these days. So this is a quite interesting thing. But of course, also there for earthquake modeling, high performance is used. Everywhere in engineering, whether it's a car, it's, a, it's an airplane, uh, you would have some form or another, again, HPC simulation. These are usually the numerical simulations based on known physical laws. Um, here, for instance, actually simulating a turbine on the stress on the turbine or the whole airplane. And some of you may even remember one of the, my students here. It's uh, actually Shabas Memon, who graduated in 2019. He was working, for instance, on ice modeling, glacier calving, a process which is also computation intensive. You need different models to connect. And he actually graduated last year uh, in this area using HPC in different ways. Terrestrial systems is a key um, idea to really understand what's happening with our Earth. Um, we see this also reflected that destination Earth will be a big program in the future, really understanding it's actually a kind of digital twin of the Earth. So this is reflected to better understand our world. And you see here, Again, coupling different models. If you want to understand the groundwater models, you need not only groundwater modeling, you need surface water modeling, and you of course need the atmosphere. This all plays into the whole ecosystem. And with this, to really understand then the groundwater modeling as an example here just, uh, of course, requires orders of magnitudes of HPC, especially if you want to do it regional. You can imagine regional weather prediction, regional climate analysis over years. This is really computational expensive. And then a large area is really systems biology, medicine. You see here um, protein folding, for instance, which is in misfolds of those, for instance, uh, assumed to be one reason for Alzheimer's research. So there's diseases which are related to this, understanding the idea. And one of the current projects we're working in at this also is, of course, lots of ideas around green energy. So how we can use HPC to support green energy. You see here an example from one of our new PhD students just started, Reza, um, who working in the RACE COE, the center of excellence with many industry partners. And one of the use cases is, is wind wheel modeling or wind farms, right? Not one wind wheel. We want to understand actually different wind wheels together, which makes it a wind farm and lots of turbulence is there and makes it basically infeasible to really use just numerical simulations. Instead, you would go for surrogate models in deep learning in AI to help here and there. So these, these are just kind of elements where we partly work on and some of them which are very known in the community where I'm not working on, but you know, just want to give you the opportunity to see where HPC is. When I boil it down to Iceland, what's happening in Iceland, we have really a strong uh, eHPC user community. You have the eHPC.s website where you can see this which basically in the, late, in the more recent proposals to get, let's say, money for this HPC machines we have here in Iceland are around already 
53 scientific experts. And when I started here, it was 17 in the proposals. And before that, uh, I talked with Jonatli a long time ago. Uh, he said it was like eight or seven. So I think we have an exponential growth in use of HPC here. And also we see that we much more team up with different players like Martis from industry, the Met Office, of course, or the Geosurvey ESOR. So this is a very good movement. What we got on top of it was luckily um, together with EBA, she was instrumental in this. Uh, we got the EuroHPC EuroCC project, which enables us to create so-called simulation and data labs together. Um, I come to this again and again through the talk. You will see that where we do some community building. This is not a top-down structure of command. This is really just supporting bottom-up um, the presence of the scientific groups here that require HPC and being a contact point maybe to industry and other academic groups. How is this all funded? This should be not forgotten. We should be grateful to Rennes. Um, at least we also in Germany do this every now and then to uh, really thank our Ministry of Education. And I think here um, I can also say that Rennes really sees the need for HPC. They always fund these proposals. The latest one was actually a roadmap idea of funding where really outline five years, essentially how this should look like, which researchers will benefit from it. And it's a very positive movement compared to the whole world that runs as a funding organization or basically the funding instrument of the government to be more precise is really reflecting this based on peer review. So um, this is, let's say the, the moderate scale. If you want to really support users that are really going to very high number of scales using, let's say, petascale systems. We have the Lumi supercomputer system where we also actually co-fund a little bit these activities where, let's say, some of the researchers here that have really an extraordinary um, you know, requirement to access, let's say, very many GPUs or really large scale runs with CPUs, there's a Lumi supercomputer that we can use. And uh, for teaching education, I think there are largely two organizations here, University of Reykjavik and University of Iceland. We work together hand in hand, um, actually together also in Arctic webinar series with US in order to be more on the US side of things. I will talk lots of times about Europe and we get lots of funds from Europe and that's a good thing. But we should never forget that of course, uh, US is also a strong partner and with Iceland being in the middle, we have there of course also good corporations. Speaking of the corporations you see here as the sixth kind of pillar there is of course biased a little bit from my talk now. There are many more international corporations um, though which we see. Um, I think Decode is just one of it that has many of them. So here we see many joint uh, PhDs with the Uli Supercomputing Center in Germany. This is instrumental to get really access to large HPC systems. Then on the technical side, um, what we really have here also right now is a couple of EC projects or so European Commission projects that really fund the students, right? So DPIS is one example or the Ray Center of Excellence. I will come back to it again and again. So the European Commission funds is instrumental for us and there are different funding methods that everybody I would encourage you to look at, like for instance, digital innovation hubs have been just launched here in Iceland to apply to. So this is a very important activity that perhaps some here on the um, basically on the call here actually could realize and to to engage in. More on the strategic plan, we think about several activities with the US of more broadening these activities in the long term. It's really a strategic idea with some investors of maybe creating something like an Icelandic national lab. The ministries are involved, Business Iceland is involved, but so so far it's just a strategic idea to really foster more of the research in a really joint venture between different universities and industry. Now, when you think about the focus of the talk, I could talk now about physical um, simulations. The focus here is rather on artificial intelligence. It's a new topic, uh, which is really fueled by machine learning. And when you want to understand the difference, this slide maybe helps a bit. You would say essentially that you have artificial intelligence is a very large field. Uh, also having robotics and lots of other areas which we not really address today. When I'm talking about artificial intelligence, I mean the area of machine learning. So you're really learning from data instead of just explicitly program something in the programming language. Um, still, of course, you have some source code, which is largely basically machine learning code like training, testing, validation. Um, a very specific part of machine learning is deep learning. So this is the ability really to learn underlying features from data 
here in machine learning, we did a lot of feature engineering, feature generation. We created features out of the data. And deep learning is there, as a little bit alluded here, with different layers, which are not just neurons you put there as a deep network. They are smart layers. They catch the surroundings of one pixel, for instance, or they actually could be, you know, storing several features through time with LSTM networks and the memory in it. So these are very smart, deep neural networks, which are not just, let's say, those that they have already in the 60s and made deeper. That's a common misunderstanding. So the innovation relies not just purely in this. Also, essentially, these deep learning networks have all their unique selling proposition, let it be ResNet 50, unsupervised learning networks, or maybe guns, generative models that you even have seen. Typical machine learning methods, some of you may already know, classification of data is a new data item comes, I want to know in which group it is. Clustering, I don't really have a group existing, but I see through similarity measures, like the ruler distance or Euclidean distance here, that those points are closer together, so I can cluster them. And of course, there are regression methods that give you trends in data. But deep learning is really something I will talk today a lot because we publish there a lot. We do lots of activities. And here you see now very nicely how features from one digit are actually carved out in so-called different features maps to basically then help with identification essentially uh, of this digit. Of course, we don't want to stay with digits. Uh, we have much more bigger problems to solve. And that's why I also want to make now the connection why AI and big data is so intertwined with HPC and clouds today. And this was a similar question I got from the perhaps highest call I had in Germany. I was speaking in the federal parliament um, and with a task to do on one slide or basically on, on one uh, five minute slide, the interconnect of AI, big data and HPC, right? So why is it all connected? And I tried to do this with this slide and I got very good feedback. This is somehow working. Essentially, you would have always a data set volume that matters a lot in AI, that's understandable. And when you not have so much data, uh, then you usually don't go for deep learning. There are data augmentation techniques, there are several tricks that you can do and maybe then perform deep learning. But essentially what I'm seeing here with the accuracy is relatively high, uh, doesn't, is, is not really valid in this area because here we don't have really much data and in this areas, you still go for older traditional models like support vector machines, like random forests. Uh, so these are basically models that stand the test of time. We call them the traditional learning models of machine learning. The trouble is if you go bigger and bigger with data, you will come some serial limits. So just working with serial MATLABs or SkyKit Learn here and there could lead into trouble. The memory doesn't fit or it takes just very long time to go through all the transactions maybe if you do let's say some retail data analysis. Hence, um, basically you, you have to go in parallel. And once you go in parallel, you have different frameworks, which then means you have more and more time to, to speak uh, used as a footprint here for computing. And this falls back together when you do neural networks or larger neural networks that we call then this deep learning networks like convolutional neural networks, for instance. So they will have a large footprint where GPUs today is really instrumental to really have this large deep learning networks. And if you have this capacity, uh, then you can be sure that actually the accuracy will follow suit. So what we, I remember Thomas, Philip Brunasson and we, we basically in the beginning said, this is a HOAX deep learning. Um, this was maybe 10 years ago. And today's we have really a proof that deep learning in many ways has uh, actually overcome all the standards we know from computer vision and can have uh, tremendous results. Not always, especially depending on actually the, the kind of data sets that you have, of course, but this brings it all together. So what we do in terms of preserving the environment. So um, as I said, I come back to the Icelandic HPC community again and again. Here you see the simulation and data lab remote sensing where I'm myself also very active, but also Gabriel Cavallaro, um, someone who is actually graduating here, and a couple of other PhD students I will talk about in the next couple of slides. When you want to know what remote sensing is, it's essentially thinking about um, you know, what we can do with the satellite data that comes uh, basically in large streams today from many different satellites out there. And they not only deliver spectral information, you see here a little bit the interesting part that when you have a spectral channels with different wavelengths of light, you can identify materials. So what the world is made of, like soil, water, vegetation. 
So this helps us to identify the land cover easily. Um, it's of course a challenge here if you have mixed pixels and unbalanced classes, and of course it's not so easy anymore. Speaking of which, it's not only spectral information, it's also spatial information. So of course, we're not interested here in understanding it's looking like a cat or cow like you see in the media. Here we want to have pixel-wise classification. So which pixel is water, which pixel is you know, green in order to understand, for instance, how green is a city. And of course, the surrounding pixels give you some information about it. Hence, we also work a lot with the spatial information in this area. Oops, a bit frozen here, oops. Okay, this is an overview and I will not talk about all of the different um, elements in it. And you will see that the basic blueprint of these layers, storage, hardware, different libraries with TensorFlow, machine learning libraries, JupyterLab for interactive access, the infrastructures, large computing, uh, computing systems, HPC, um, Docker environments and singularity. So containers play a huge role. Cloud computing plays a role with Amazon. Another course I teach complementary to the HPC course and much more adopted by industry, I have to say. And of course, then um, let's say more frameworks on the political side. So who is funding all of these millions of supercomputers? Um, so your HPC is one of these instrument. Uh, in the past, it was Praise. So, and Praise is still there and basically working together with EuroHPC. So in terms of applications, what we then do is really taking such, let's say a cube of multispectral data uh, and then basically having a machine and deep learning training and understanding how we can create classifiers to really determine, is this a water, is this a soybean, is it a tree and so on. Of course, we do this with up to 52 classes or more so it's not only binary classification or object detection like cat, dog, which is often in the media. Now, the interesting thing for HPC is um, this is really costly to train. And what we do is we combine different GPUs here. We call that distributed training of let's say cutting edge deep learning networks called ResNet50. I come to that in a moment. And for this, the HPC device is really essential to have because they are the libraries that really can then have this execution time that you see here by adding more and more GPUs, significantly reduced to just a couple of minutes. Here you see an example of 128 GPUs in parallel. And you have here always the references alongside, so where you can have more information. Of course, it's an overview talk of all my research, essentially to connect for all of you out there. So in the end, um, of course, the details are here in the different publications. And as I said to you, these have been interesting times. So Gabriel in 2016 was graduating at the University of Iceland, already working in this field of remote sensing and where we created a parallel and scalable support vector machine, which is still today one of the most scalable SVM out there in open source. And what we do there is essentially shown here when you compare it with MATLAB, you actually boil down the time from 14 minutes to one minute to analyze it with a support vector machine but if you know a little bit about this, it's a classifier where you have to do lots of parameter search. You also have to execute the whole grid here to understand what is the kernel parameter here or what cost you allow in terms of basically statistical learning theory and allowing some error. So in the end, you also don't want to lose accuracy if you see, but of course here, when you do this just for one run, you boil it down to one minute, but as you have to consider the whole grid, you actually boil down nine hours of work to just half an hour. And this was some work. We have to, of course, have scalable algorithms in this where lots of memory access problems are there from the original authors for PSVM. So don't use that. Use ours that we actually also maintain in the simulation and data lab. Then HPDB scan, maybe some of you already remember. I mean, the PhD students had together with Oliver Peter Paulson, for instance, Markus Götz here, uh, where we did clustering. And uh, this algorithm he actually created is still very cited today. It's, I think, the most scalable DBSCAN open, uh, basically an open source still today. And if not, then basically come to me and prove me wrong. It scales very nicely on hybrid MPI and OpenMP. And of course, is uh, interesting also to, to have in different areas of research. You see here, basically, we use point clouds of cities to reconstruct essentially then um, a city in itself from point clouds, but also whole countries where then, of course, HPC becomes a requirement. 
The tricky part in research is, of course, a smart load balancing. You never have a clear data setup where everything fits nicely on all the, let's say, different cores. You see, we use here 512 cores, for instance, in this setup, or Twitter tweets that we have analyzed here in another data set. So these have been research without deep learning, traditional uh, machine learning. And of course, we also do today lots of research with innovative hardware in HPC. So one of the examples is here by um, PhD student Erdny Erlingsson, that is a PhD student with me and Helmut working in the D project. Um, this was a project co-designing so something we call the modular supercomputing approach, where we don't believe that a monolithic system will be the future. We believe in the different setup of a cluster module, again, with high signal threat performance, and then the extreme scale booster to really have very large scale runs, for instance, on many GPUs. And then a data analytics module with very large memory, having Spark and these workloads on it. And then, of course, a storage system. So really modular setup where we also, of course, add on quantum computing in the future. And we did publications, for instance, with network attached memory, something which is not yet on the market, or basically played around a lot with uh, GPU direct and uh, so-called you know, basically interconnects of GPUs by avoiding this NV link and NV switches islands. So all of these is a little bit um, elaborate to be in more detail, but essentially talking about leveraging really a lot what is new in hardware is of course also something which shows sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. And for this, strategic partners are important. You see the Yuli Supercomputing Center here, for instance, is one of our key partners, but not the only one. Um, we see here an exascale system really in 2023, probably um, emerging, which is co-funded mm -hmm. by the European Commission, of course. Um, here's also a video if you want to understand the modular system. And it's really something which is also built by the applications as co-design. So where you see that deep learning could be maybe for training, have, let's say, um, something on the cluster module computed. And then for inference, which is really highly scalable and with a very low computing footprint, you can actually scale this quite up uh, in the booster. So different workloads. And of course, then we think about future technology, quantum modules and neuromorphic modules already. Still to say a few words, it's important still for Iceland to have HPC resources locally. So it's not a point to fund Lumi. It's not a point to fund Yuli here. The idea is rather to think about um, that this is complementary. What we do with deep learning. So you see here, Gabriel is still, you know, doing lots of research in this area um, using innovative deep learning network like convolutional neural networks. Um, here, the challenges is often the rare ground truth. So we don't want to reuse pixels. That's a bad thing if you do this in, in machine learning theory. So here, this is a big problem. But of course, a key problem remains all the parameters. So hyperparameter tuning of a deep learning network is today quite an important factor. And you can even combine different, um, let's say, approaches. You see that here is a nice paper where actually traditional SVM models have been used in combination with deep learning in the layers. So hence, we do a lot, of course, with remote sensing data sets and then experimenting which of the new AI frameworks, which of the new um, deep learning networks is really interesting um, to, to use in this area. And here's one good example, ResNet50, which is let's say a de facto standard deep learning network, very hard to train. Uh, you see 25.6 millions of trainable parameters. So here is really something where you need lots of GPUs. And you see here one example in Jubils. Um, this was an older system, the Volta 100, not the Ampere system that we have now, the Ampere NVIDIAs. So this is a V100 still where we use, let's say example here, 96, uh, basically uh, 69, um, GPUs in parallel. And we do this with a technology called Horovod, which is then interconnecting these GPUs. We train essentially this um, deep learning network then in parallel. And every now and then the error, the averages will be then exchanged with an all reduced operation, still a traditional MPI, um, let's say, setup. Maybe for you, important to know this is much of research done by Rocco Sedona. It's a PhD student also here at the University of Iceland. He is probably coming actually next year in January when the pandemic is over and probably some of you already had him in classes. Then we have the whole idea of quantum machine learning which would take um, I think the whole hour to talk about. 
So we do uh, very much of it. Um, for those of you who are very interested, I gave also in Ute Messan a large talk on how to understand quantum annealing. It's important to understand that this is reality, so we really use it. Um, it's not, let's say, uh, also ROAX. We have, of course, here the challenge that we still have, let's say, binary classification problems. We just increasing this with new publications now, but let's say it's really baby steps. We have a 2000 qubit system, then the 5000 qubit system. We're not there yet, but for machine learning, this is really a great thing because optimization problems are just beautiful to be solved. Um, when you want to find the minima of a problem, you can Im imagine that essentially what quantum computing is doing, it just puts a lot of water on it and sees where the sink and everything is running in at the same time, while we not doing any more SGD and iterative optimization. So this is a future technology, admittedly very early, but we publish already quite often there and also have a quantum SVM that can be used uh, basically for, let's say, relatively small to moderate problems. What we do in two terms of improving our healthcare. So another area, um, and you see that remote sensing there, they're very strong already. Um, and of course, it comes from the inheritance here. Universe of Iceland was well, traditionally very strong in this area and remote sensing has open data sets, which contributes also to this fact. And here you see another simulation data lab health and medicine, where is another PhD student with me from the Universe of Iceland, Shadi Barakat here. And we have of course some legacy projects here for, from Germany, where we work together with university clinics and uh, lots of hospitals to understand really AI and what we can do there. Of course, it starts a lot with bringing data together of different patients now in the pandemic, but also before we did aspects of ARDS research, for instance, the acute respiratory distress syndrome. But this is an interesting paper where you see that Germany is essentially not really ready yet. Um, we really have a low HPC and AI usage still. There are strict regulations. And when it comes to data sharing across um, different hospitals and basically for rare diseases as one example, then you really have data silos all over the place, which are of course related to GDPR and, and things like reiterating on clinical studies, meaning that you have maybe used the data for one study and you inform the patient, you cannot just simply reuse the data for another study. You have to go back to the patients. So there are different, let's say, hindrances in this area uh, where we work on. And again, you see a similar setup you have seen before on remote sensing, and that makes clear why it's a key technology, HPC. You see almost the same ingredients, maybe here and there, a little bit differently scheduled, and some add-ons. Here's a Git-based data management system we use called DataLet, uh, which is quite interesting for large data sets, or if we collaborate with a specific infrastructure in neuroscience here in, in Canada. Um, but essentially, you see that we reuse, of course, the same systems for different areas of science. Right here now we're in the health and medicine area, we're touching also the neuroscience area and doing it for different elements, time series analysis with large deep learning networks, for instance, for this acute respiratory distress syndrome. But also here in the COVID-19 times, we've done some work on chest X-ray analysis and see how we can better this. So where are the students that fuel all of this? Um, as I said, Shadi Barakat is here really uh, very active in this area of RDS research. How we tackle this in general is to combine mechanical modeling um, essentially with deep learning, with machine learning to make it then also hopefully in some point in time personalized. That's one of the goal in Smith. Um, and this is basically something which is a very large endeavor. So this is, let's say, um, this PhD student together with the whole project and a couple of other machine learning experts working on this with real patients data, but also with a mimic database that we have as an open database. All of these approaches require massive computation resources, mostly for parameter setups. Then for the COVID-19 X-ray analysis, as I said to you, the chest X-rays, we have uh, different images from a so-called COVID-NET and COVID-X data set, a public uh, network, and also with an associated data set we basically looked into, and that we can also here and there better with, let's say, performing something we call transfer learning. So that means we basically train on simple ideas like ImageNet, which is essentially saying we classify cows and cats again. But once we have trained this and the basically the deep learning network is properly trained, we then make the move to the real science, uh, which is then essentially here in this area, COVID-19 chest X-ray analysis 
And more details, of course, in different areas of science you find in a recent paper we compiled here, where really the Juvel's booster, so many different GPUs are required to really to, to strive there and make really good performances, as you can essentially see in this area. And teams from the Helmholtz AI team was also involved, not only Shadi uh, here, I should also mention Gisli, uh, who is one of my master's students who also contributed in this. We collaborate with a pharma company that also thinks um, this COVID net needs still some work, especially in practical setups and clinical setups, and there we're working on as well. Thinking a bit about neuroscience, it's very new here in Iceland. There's a new PhD student called Peter Helgi Einarsson. He essentially just started more or less with having uh, quite some work already done on uh, basically the computing setup of things. So he will do a PhD research related to the cerebellum, the small brain here, and, and work there in the neurosciences. But to get there, to get the data, you have to work on Datalet, which is a data management system. You have to work on actually get containers run on these HPC machines because neuroscientists, and also especially those in Canada, we collaborate here uh, with McGill and Alan Evans is one of the guys behind it. He has quite a page index, quite known in the community, uh, basically, and, and they do a lot of workflows and containers. And that's why we basically work there a lot of technology enabling as well. And as you see, I talked about the simulation and data labs. It's of course, not only my labs uh, that you see the two. Um, you see also we have natural language processing here with a new professor called Hafstein Einarsson. We have, of course, um, the tactile engineering and acoustics where Runa has this lab from the sound of, you know, sound of vision project and basically the enhancement. It, there are lots of new things happening and many other labs like Vida with physics side. Uh, we have Hannes um, also for the chemical side and more and more people are actually joining us. And also it's an invitation here on the call to think about uh, if you could form such a lab. You see also uh, one that I would like to highlight, which is then the one for mathematics. Uh, because there it's also essential when you go to the website, also University of Reykjavik included. So we're teaming up together very much. So basically as one of the last um, examples, rebuilding our economy, um, you know, retail is at the bottom of, um, you know, surviving. I think in some cities I hear about 150 stores will be um, basically after the pandemic shut down or have been already shut down uh, in smaller cities like 10,000 people. So it's, it's something which has a huge impact, at least in Germany, maybe in Iceland, here in Reykjavik, we see a, uh, this will coming up again as soon as the tourists can come back. But for many German cities, that's a big problem. And we help there with many different areas. Um, and one of them I want to highlight is really then using deep learning, interestingly enough, behind the scene. Again, the setup here you see is not really changed a lot. We have still GPUs, but here we have now more for retail uh, expert system recommendation systems, what to buy, what not to buy, personalized recommendations we get out of transaction data. And also here, this is done by Shadi Barakat with a team in Germany as well, um, basically saying he does a paper study here or a reading paper out of this and then uh, get some credits for it. You see, it's not really a medical domain, but he could exactly use his knowledge on deep learning very nicely to help here with an interesting use case where we just enrich the product database. We have the pre-trained network on essentially ImageNet and we just reusing that and then with, uh, basically with the transfer learning idea, again, tune it to our needs so that basically people that come in the store can suddenly say, well, I want a perfume that looks like uh, a gold bar. And, and this gold bar information is usually not in the information of the products. So, so clearly there's an image, but of course um, the databases don't really find it if you just step in the store or you want something called a cocktail shaker. And you see interesting enough perfumes these days have quite interesting shapes, right? And this is one area where we work there. Um, another one is of course a more traditional area with FP Gross collaborative filtering. This is the area of things you know with recommendations. You see it daily essentially. We do this under the umbrella of the on for off project that also funds a couple of things. More recently, and, and this will be basically then the, the last elements here coming also towards the end of my talk now and inviting for questions. We just kicked off the Race Center of Excellence, which has a couple of very interesting use cases uh, from different, let's say, physical domains combined with AI and then also data intensive use cases. And here the key idea is really that we hate uh, the intertwine HPC and AI. 
There are also different industry players on board from Atos, Safran that do basically um, new forms of helicopter fuels. So there's a lot of basically um, industry collaboration going on. And as you see, essentially the idea of traditional physics, combining them with the AI would be one of the goals. And then of course, scaling this up to exascale because we know already by combining those two strategies, we really require lots of um, basically computing. So when it is about the people, of course, you see lots of use cases. That means we need lots of people and we are very lucky to have a couple of new members. I already talked about Reza, a CFD specialist that is actually engaging in these different CFD problems here from wind wheels, also up to the Safran helicopter, as I was mentioning, all computational fluid dynamics problems. Hence, he is also a member of the computational fluid dynamics uh, simulation and data lab. But we have also Marcel Ach, as one example, starting here with his experience in the CFD in race, contributing to the use cases. Um, for remote sensing, we get also help by Zorbi. Um, she is just about to start here also as a PhD student and will work a little bit with seismic imaging. Uh, basically also the idea in the moment is about geothermal um, and also connecting this then with seismic imaging and remote sensing. Some of you already know maybe Runa, I hope so at least. Uh, he is here, our head of faculty. So we have a joint PhD together here, or two PhDs here in the middle is also one. He doesn't talk so much usually, but um, Eric here, Michael Summer is also about to start and works essentially on the legacy of the Sound of Vision project and make it with the interesting years you have maybe seen or uh, the ideas around sound and how you can learn from all of this. There's a sound engineering setup of ears, individual ears and hearing will be one of his study areas under the umbrella of race. For this, I really want to close just a summary and outlook. Um, I think you have seen many things and while I'm doing and summarize now, I think I have almost used my 40 minutes now. This initial five minutes we st uh, basically talked uh, or started later. You see here a couple of um, already um, industry related use cases, um, of course, all scientifically driven a little bit. But when you have a summary now, essentially, then you would say that HPC is really key in technology for science and engineering. There's no way around it. Maybe not for every area, but in one way or another, many of those actually are touching this and requiring HPC. If not today, then probably in the next 10 years. Industry usage can be still advanced. So many use very commercial clouds, cost intensive clouds, and where maybe HPC here and there um, could be also helping. Of course, this is a world that combine, uh, that, that people have to combine these days. Uh, actually, HPC machines in clouds these days that are also affordable. So, but still the industry usage really on these things can be increased, which is also reflected why we in the Euro HPC governing board talk so much about industry engagement. Also think about co-funding that many of the HPC systems we know are mostly academically funded, government funded, and of course, we have to come to a way to jointly fund them with industry together. The landscape of HPC, however, is so complex um, that it's hard to get people. You really require large interdisciplinary teams to strive in this area. When you think about the skill set, you have people from HPC, technical, you have basically people from AI with methods, and then you need even domain expertise to really strive in your academic field or in your scientific or engineering field. So these three ingredients together doesn't come very often. And so in this sense, uh, I think the, there's really a requirement for people that we need and education to really come to a better workforce, also for industry that is always complaining. But I know many from us also are actually heavy, uh, having this PhD recruiting problem. In order to tackle this complexity, I could be joining up here with two of my fellow professors where I'm very thankful about for in the last eight years, we collaborated significantly. We got EU grants together uh, like race now or before deepest, we will use the interaction room to decipher all the different HPC AI and domain specific applications together. And they're really experts in the field of getting essentially to these different requirements of all these different areas. So from the tool set perspective, HPC can really do a lot, but mastering this tool set is not trivial. And that's why, again, the idea is going to the education. And this will be essentially my last slide just saying uh, that we're currently working on a master of HPC call from the European Commission together with the University of Reykjavik and with many others. Uh, Cyprus is one of it, Jülich and Aachen, 
uh, in order to foster master of science in HPC. So there's also future funding if you see in the Horizon Europe and uh, Digital Europe program, sorry, 2021 to 27 foreseen already in the Euro HPC joint undertaking for education and master of HPC because there's a real shortage of people that work in this area, sadly, because we could do much more. So that's all I really wanted to leave on the table for you. The references are here to follow up all the different papers, technology links, and of course, I'm here at the university. Perhaps my last thanks go to my team. You would see these slides you have seen to convince governments to really give multi-millions of money into these systems. This is a research not just done by me. This is really the research here of these uh, gentlemen. We have to improve on gender, as you see, definitely. So we have Zorbi now, which is uh, very encouraging. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Maurice. Uh, thank you for a very comprehensive lecture. Uh, no doubts that you have uh, been in this business for a while, been doing very good work uh, together with your team. Uh, nice that you have this big team around you. Uh, also, uh, congratulate you on your graphical skills. Very nice presentation, busy slides, but you managed to talk through them uh, brilliantly. So, so again, thank you for that. Um, I have no questions in the chat. Uh, people are busy following your following your slides. <laughs> uh, people, uh, any 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 question that you want to state directly to uh, Morris, please don't hesitate. Nobody. Right. I mean, I could basically, in the meantime, maybe respond to that. Uh, you see here, for instance, this machine. The, and, and all the others, um, these are really multi-millions of machines. So hence you need really, let's say, convincing arguments. You need yeah. full slides in a sense and lots of um, content and many groups together to really acquiring such systems. Yeah. And, and this is not easy because people would say, yeah, you can go to the cloud. Amazon is giving this. But in the end, the trouble is that Amazon is very costly. We talk about, for instance, for a cutting edge GPU, $24 an hour. Oh, right. So that's uh, some of my researchers already calculated this as would be multi thousands of yeah. money for one paper. 